All right, Psalm chapter 5. There's a lot here, just like every other psalm that we've gone through is packed with doctrine. We see a lot of um, judgment uh, that's spoken of here in this psalm by God, and we're going to see that a lot in many of the psalms. But this is something that we need to, to be paying attention to. There's an aspect of God that we're going to get into in a little bit that many people have either overlooked or they don't want to think about or they don't even think exists. And we're going to dig into that. It's about the middle of the chapter here. But it, it's really important to understand, you know, we go to church, we read the Bible, that God is real. And that God is a God to be worshipped. And that God is a God that demands respect. And that God is a God that is not mocked, as I, as I preached on, on Sunday. God is not mocked. God will not be ridiculed. Okay? We need to have the proper respect as we see here. Look at Psalm uh, 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation as David is going to God in prayer, in psalm here, he's saying, you know, listen to my words. Please consider my meditation. Consider what I'm coming to you with. And hearken unto the voice of my cry. In verse 2, my king and my God, for unto thee will I pray. And we see here David approaching God with a respect and calling him, hey, my king. I mean, think about who is a king? What does a king do? A king rules, right? A king is the supreme ruler and the king dictates what happens and because a king is has such power and is such a ruler the king will then in turn uh, command what what the subjects are to do and that we ought to reverence the king and give him the respect that he deserves please take him out and deal with him verse number two Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. And you know, when we go to God in prayer, we need to remember who God is. We need to remember that God is all, an almighty God, that God is our King, and give Him that respect. When we pray, we use titles to God. We give God the thanks and the, and the, the credit that He deserves, and we should be very humble in our attitude towards God. Now, we can boldly ask for things while remaining humble at the same time. Girls, stop that right now. Listen up front. Here, listen to the preaching. When we pray to God, you need to have respect for God, the Father in heaven. We need to be able to Go to him and realize who he is and not just talk to him flippantly and, and you know, um, use type of language when we pray to God that would bring down his name or, or kind of make it less holy. And we, we'll see this as a pattern throughout Scripture. Even Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6 when he gives us the example of how to pray unto God. He tells us exactly how to do it. And he says in verse number 5 of Matthew 6, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse number, let's jump down to verse number um, 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So it start, the prayer should start off when we pray to God, should start off, you know, just expressing how holy God is. I was just saying, when, it, when it says that hallowed be thy name, it means God, your name is holy. It's sanctified, it's set apart. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We should be asking for for God's will to be done. Because God's will right now is done in heaven. But is God's will always being done on earth? No, it's not. But our prayers to God, we should be praying and asking for things that would be according to God's will because we don't want to pray for things or ask God to do things 
that would be contrary to his will. Obviously, we want to be in accordance with God. Even Jesus Christ, when he was praying to God to see if there was another way that he can satisfy God's wrath and satisfy the, the penalties for our sins, other than having to go to the cross to do it. If there's any other way to do it, he wanted to do it. But nevertheless, when he prayed, he said, not my will, not according to my will, but thy will be done. Jesus still had in his heart that he was still going to be in accordance with the will of the Father. And that's very important that when we pray, we consider what is God's will and that we would be praying according to God's will and that we could just mention to say, God, you know, if this isn't according to your will, you know, I want your will to be done. We want to pray for people to be healed. We want to pray for different things in our life. And ultimately, though, we want God's will to be done. He continues on here in, in the sample prayer in Matthew 6, which is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom. And again, ascribing to God, God, you have the kingdom. It's your kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, exalting our Lord, exalting God and, and just expressing that in our prayer. Look at verse number three in Psalm five. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Keep your finger here. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 88. Prayer is a very important part of the Christian life. We should be communicating with God. We should be thinking about God. And, and I would challenge you to pray every morning. Pray before you really start your day. Start your day with hearing from God and speaking to God. I recommend praying to God as well as reading something from his word. Even if it's not the bulk of your Bible reading for the day, I would recommend getting at least a chapter in or something like that. Read in the morning and pray in the morning. Give God the first fruits of your day. Give God the first thought of your day. When you wake up, read from his word, pray unto him, and hear from him. We're going to see other examples of the morning specifically or other times being mentioned in prayer to God. And I think, you know, if you want your day to start off right, well, what a better way than to be already mindful of the things of God to keep us away from temptations, to keep us away from the evil way when we start off regularly thinking about the Lord and praying to God, that will help us. Because let's face it, it's easy to fall into routines. It's easy to get distracted with everything else. And, and there's a lot of things that need to be done in our life that's important. You know, I need to go to work. My wife has work to do at home. We all have stuff that needs to get done. But instead of just getting completely distracted for the whole day, we can start off our day in prayer to God and hearing from His Word. And we start off the day praying to Him and just exalting Him. That's going to help to keep us humble. It's going to help to keep us right. It's going to help to make us make the right decisions every day of our life. Psalm 88, verse number 13, the Bible says, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. So here's another psalm just saying, I'm going to pray to you in the morning. We saw in, in Mark, we see an example of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 1, verse number 35. The Bible says, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day. So Jesus gets up really early before the break of dawn. Jesus gets up and says he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Jesus lost some sleep in order to pray. He got up early. He got up before the dawning of the day just to get up and spend some time alone. It says in a solitary place where no one could see him, no one can hear him. He went off to have time alone with the Father. And that is an example that we all should be able to follow. Take the time. Wake up. Take the time to be alone with God and pray unto God. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 55. You should still be in Psalm. Psalm 55, verse number 17. 
The Bible says evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. There's many ways that we can pray, but I, I do, I still firmly believe that we should be praying out loud probably as much as possible. There's times where it may not be um, always appropriate to be vocalizing your prayers and actually saying them out loud if you're, if you're in, a, in a place or in an area and you, you know, you're praying to God with your heart and your, in your mind. Um, that's fine. It's acceptable. We see examples of that in Scripture of people doing that. But we ought to remember that, that we ought not to just let that replace our prayers. And we ought to speak to God with our voice and just, and just you know, call on Him and, and talk to Him out loud. Cry aloud. And, and here we see at evening, morning, and at noon. There's three specific times here that, that are given in Psalm 55 of, of praying to God. We ought to be pray, you know, praying once a day to God, I don't think is enough. We ought to be praying multiple times. We ought to be keeping God at the forefront of our minds and asking Him for things and asking for direction and asking for wisdom. Prayer is very important. We're going to get there's so much when it comes to prayer in the book of Psalms. We're going to get into this also, but I just want to deal with this one aspect of when to pray. When should we be praying? We should be praying in the morning. Pray the first thing you get up. Pray to God. Ask Him to help you with the day. Ask for the patience that you need. Ask for the guidance that you need. Ask for, for whatever it is that you need to get through your day. Ask Him for that every day. That's why Jesus, when He was given the example in Matthew chapter 6, said, give us this day our daily bread. We're continually relying upon God. God, please just help me for this day to, be, to feed me. God, please just help me this day to get my work done. God, please help me for this day. And you know what the great prayer is every single day, especially in the month of February, during our soul winning challenge. God, please help me this day to preach the gospel to somebody. God, please allow me to cross paths with someone whose heart you've already worked on, Lord. Please help me to be the instrument, to be the ambassador, to be the workman that can lead somebody to Christ because you've already been working in their life. Other people have already been working. And, and Lord, just please let me to be that person today to help lead someone to life, to, to help reap today. Just as much as we ask for our daily bread and our daily food, we should be asking for things like that. This is it's a great way to start off our day. And, and not just in the morning, but evening, morning, and at noon. Pray, cry aloud. We see Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, he practiced this. And after the decree was made, because they're trying to... Um, some wicked people in the kingdom that were, that were subordinate to Daniel were, were trying to get Daniel in trouble. And they knew that he wasn't doing anything wrong. Everything that he did lined up. He, he kept things on the up and up. He wasn't a wicked man. He wasn't, um, they couldn't find any reason, any way that they can, they can trap him other than the fact that he gave more credence to the Lord and his words than to any of man's laws. So they devised this, this law that they were going to pass to where nobody can pray unto God without basically getting permission first, without, without first um, getting approval or, or, or going to the king first. And of course, nobody comes before the Lord. And when there's a law that contradicts God's law or that would subordinate God, then we don't, we don't obey that. We're not obliged to obey those laws. And when Daniel had uh, found out about that, he knew about that. He continued right on doing exactly what he did before. He didn't have to change his routine. He just kept doing what he was doing. And he prayed. And we gather from this story, I'll read this verse for you, Daniel 6, verse 10. The Bible says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He didn't change his routine one bit. He didn't close his windows. Oh man, I don't want anyone to hear me. It's illegal now. No, he left his windows open. He prayed toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees and he prayed to God three times a day. Why? Because it was the right thing for him to do. 
Because he's not going to be worried what man can do unto him, but he's more concerned about what God will do unto him. And he knows that he doesn't have to ask anybody before he can pray unto the Lord. And that's exactly what he did. And what's interesting about this story is that they accused him. They found him guilty of, of breaking that law. Why? Because he prayed out loud. He didn't close his windows. He didn't pray in his heart. He didn't pray with his mind. He still prayed out loud as he always did. Now, if Daniel, under threat of being thrown into a den of lions, is able to get on his knees three times a day and pray out loud with his voice, Why can't any of you? Why can't we? Why can't we get on our knees? Why can't we pray out loud to God? Are you worried about what people might think? Are you worried about looking silly? Daniel wasn't worried about what people thought. He wasn't even worried about being put to death for it. We need to get a little bit more boldness. We need to be able to pray and be able to pray aloud and not worry what other people think. You know, if, if you normally pray before you eat and ask God to, to bless things and you thank God, which is something I believe we all ought to do, just because you go out to eat somewhere doesn't mean you should just not do that. Or worry about, oh, what are people going to think? We got our heads bowed. They're going to know we're praying. Yeah, you know what? Maybe they should see that you're praying. Praise God. Not that you're trying to make a public spectacle of it, but at least someone else might get a little bit of boldness in that and say like, oh, well, I see them praying. It's not that big of a deal, and I could pray too. Let's go back to Psalm 5, where we were. Psalm 5, verse number 4. The Bible says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, Neither shall evil dwell with thee. Verse number five. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. And remember from last week, leasing just means like lying. It's being untruthful. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. And this is what I was alluding to at the beginning of the sermon. There's many people out there that, that don't fully know who God even is. They don't understand all the attributes of our Lord. And they have a one-sided vision of who God is. On Sunday, I preached a sermon about loving the brethren. And we saw in, in the book of 1 John, the verse that says, God is love. And praise God, yes, God is love. And no one is more loving than God. No one has more love. No, you know, greater love hath no man than this. And a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his own life for us. The Father laid down his only begotten Son for, for us, for sinners, for people who don't deserve it. Yes, God is love. Absolutely. But the Bible doesn't say that God is love and only love. It does say that he's love, but it's not the only attribute that God has. Because there's another attribute that God has that people seem to want to shy away from. And actually, many people in this world will, will end up judging God, judging the God of the Bible, judging our Lord because of the hatred. Because hatred and hating has become such an evil word today that people just stop their ears at the first sign of someone even mentioning that they hate. Oh, no, hatred, that's so bad. We can't hate. No, no, Christians aren't supposed to hate anything. Well, I've got some news for you. Yes, yes, there is a time to hate, and we're going to get into that in a minute. But first, we're going to look at God. We're going to look at these attributes of God and God hating. And, you know, you have the common... Uh, catchphrase that's thrown out there, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner, and all this stuff. But we're going to see here, as we see in Psalm chapter 5, that God doesn't just hate iniquity as if he just hates the act of sin itself. He just, he just hates some action. 
Because that's not, does God hate sin? Yes, he does hate sin. God hates iniquity. But look at what the Bible says here in Psalm 5. Sorry, in verse number 5. And just, you know, before you want to just, you know, make some excuse or explain away what the Scripture says, why don't you just read the passage and believe it for what it says? And adjust your thinking to this book instead of trying to adjust this book to your thinking. Verse number five, the Bible says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou, talking to God, hatest all workers of iniquity. Notice it doesn't say thou hatest all iniquity. What does he hate? The workers of iniquity. What is workers? A people. They're people. Anyone who's working iniquity. The Bible says that God hates them. Verse number six, Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor. Abhor is a really strong word for hate. Hate strong enough. But here's the word abhor. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Again, talking about a person. Does God hate people? Yes, God hates people. Did God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son? Yes. But are there people that God hates today? Yes. And, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses really need to, to listen up to this and start reading the Bible and read a King James Bible and not their, their New World Order translation that they got. Some phony Bible that was made up just to reinforce their own preconceived ideas and their own thoughts and their own religion instead of just being concerned with the truth from God's holy word. But that's another story. But the reason why I bring up the Jehovah's False Witnesses is because they're the ones that will say that they don't want to believe in a, in a literal hell. They don't want to believe in a fiery hell, in a hell that exists where people are tortured and tormented and burned with fire and brimstone, where their souls are burning and they experience pain forever and ever and ever. They don't want to believe that. And the reason why I say, well, God is love. How would a loving God do something like that? The reason why a loving God would do something like that is because God also hates. Because he's not just love. It's not just a one faceted God that we have. Does God love? Yes, absolutely he loves. But does he hate? Yes, absolutely he hates. Otherwise, you have to deny scripture. You have to turn this, the Bible on its head to try to explain away what he's talking about here. Does he hate workers of iniquity? Yes. Does he hate the bloody and deceitful man? Yes. Because the Bible's true, and it's what it says. We're going to look up some other verses that will just reinforce this same concept. It's not just in Psalm 5. It's not just in the book of Psalms. But flip over, if you keep a bookmark here in Psalm 5, flip over to Psalm 10. Psalm 10, verse number 3, the Bible reads, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and, the blesseth, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. So right there, again, the Bible says that the Lord abhors, or he hates, the covetous. And it's talking about covetous people. It's an adjective describing a person. The next chapter, chapter 11, verse number 5, the Bible says, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him, again, referring to an individual, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God's soul hates those that love violence, that love to beat people up, that just love hurting other people, violating other people. That's what violence is. And people that love that, God's soul hates hates him individually. Leviticus chapter number 20. Leviticus chapter number 20. And again, in Leviticus 20, you know, it's very famous because you have all of these verses in here that talk about who is worthy of being put to death. Who is guilty of a crime that deserves Death. Of course, we have man. If a man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, he shall surely be put to death. 
Excuse me, if a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And abomination is something that God really hates. That's what it means. If something is abominable or it's abomination, it's extremely hated by God. Also, the Bible has in here, if a man take a wife and her mother is wickedness, they shall be burnt with fire, both he and they that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. So it goes on and on. There's so many things, and these are really wicked, wicked, perverted things that people can do. And God says, you know what? They deserve to die. They deserve to be put to death. Look, jump down to verse number 22. Getting close to the end of the, of the passage, the Bible reads, ye, therefore, ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. He said, take heed to my words and these commandments and listen to these commandments and don't break these commandments. Otherwise, the land might spew you out. You're going to be judged. Verse number 23, and ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things. And therefore, I abhorred them. It's obvious that God hated the Canaanites. This gives us a little bit more understanding as to why God hated the Canaanites. God hated the Canaanites because they broke all of these laws. What does that mean? They're full of a bunch of homos. What does that mean? They're full of a bunch of people who practice bestiality and all manner of wickedness and perversion that of all these things, they were full of violence, they were full of wickedness, and as a result, God hated them. And as I mentioned before, it's evident that God hated them. Why? Because when God sent in the children of Israel to take the promised land, when they conquered them in war, do you know what he commanded? He commanded that they kill everything, everybody. Not to take prisoners, that... The, the men, the women, the children, everybody was to die. Why? Because God's judgment was coming upon an extremely wicked, vile nation. Just as he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone out of heaven, he judged everybody in there. Everybody. The young and the old, they all died. They all perished because God's judgment came upon a wicked people. Why? Because he hated them. That's why. And if God's willing to do that, you better believe he's willing to, to throw people into hell that he hates also. Now, just because God hates someone now doesn't mean that he's always hated them. We're going to get uh, to that in a minute, but, but we see here about God loving people no more. Why? Because he used to love them. I mean, for God so loved the world. Yes, God did at one point love everybody. Every child that's born, God loves them. But there comes a point where God can hate you. God can hate people. And he does. And we're seeing that. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. This is totally scriptural. It's biblical. This fact that God hates people. He doesn't hate everybody. But there are definitely people that specifically that God hates. Deuteronomy 32, verse number 16 is where we're going to start reading. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. Now we're starting reading here in context because I want you to pay attention. Because there are people that God hates. And we see here in Deuteronomy 32 when, when people are starting with idolatry and just the, the common theme of idolatry coming up in the Bible and then a group of people or individuals becoming reprobate. Why? Because they worship and serve the creature more than the creator is blessed forever. Amen. And for this cause, God gave them up unto uncleanness. And, and, and God gives people over to a reprobate mind when they hear about God, they reject God, and they, they erect their own idols and their own gods and just completely reject the Lord. 
And what we're going to see here, the result of, of these people in Deuteronomy 32 setting up strange gods is God hating them. God abhorring those people. Let's reread this. Verse number 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom our, your fathers feared, feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. He abhorred them. When he saw what they did, he abhorred them. He didn't just abhor the idolatrous practices. He hated them. He abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. No faith. They don't believe in him. They hate him. And he hates them. Verse 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. We better believe that God has an angry side. For just as merciful and long-suffering and full of love and mercy our God is, he's the same, he has the same exact opposite to his personality, to who he is. One of wrath and vengeance and anger and hatred. He has them both. There's a balance and it has to be there. How can, you, how can you say you really love something if you don't hate that which is going to destroy what you love? How can you say you love children if you don't hate the pedophile that's going to destroy your children? Hosea chapter number 9 Hosea chapter number 9. You can turn there if you'd like. I'm just going to start reading this for you. Verse number 14. The Bible says, Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. That's a curse. Not to have children. Not to be able to feed your children. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Just, just to clarify what hating is, he says, I'm going to love them no more. I will not love them anymore. Now, is God right to hate people? Of course God is right, unless you're going to judge God. And you know what? Some people do judge God. And in fact, I was actually just um, talking to someone today. Now, he didn't, he didn't come out and say that he judges God to be wicked, but what he did say, it was actually a very interesting conversation because you, you almost never run into people like this. He said that he was a Satanist. Now, I've run into plenty of people that say that they're Satanists where all they're trying, they're, they're not really a Satanist. And that, Actually, that just happened not that long. Over the summer, we had someone that was out in the back of his truck and he's drinking some beers and he's just like, he saw me and Brother Sebastian soul winning, uh, you know, we're carrying our Bibles and stuff and he's just like, Hail Satan! And he's just, he's just being an idiot and, and people do that sometimes and they'll just say really stupid things even though they don't mean it. And we just ignored them. We're just like, whatever, you know. I mean, you should never let someone like that scare you away. It's, it's, there's nothing scary about it. The guy's just a fool. We just continued on about our business. We knocked on some doors. And then as we were leaving, you know, then he's like, oh, hey, I'm sorry, guys. You know, I'm so I don't really believe that and all this other stuff. He was just being an idiot. But the guy at the door that today that I talked to, when he said he was a Satanist, I can, you, you can kind of tell the way that people are acting that I didn't think that he was joking. So, so I asked him, I was like, well, what, what type of Satanist are you? Because there's, what there is today, there's a bunch of atheists that belong to like the church of Satan. 
And a lot of these people, they don't believe in a being like of Satan. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in any of that stuff. They just use this Satanist as a, as a way to upend our culture and just to get people, you know, either just, just angry or upset or um, whatever. They, they, they have their, their reasons for using that to try to get people to think or like, oh, how can you be a Satanist? Where they don't actually, you know, quote unquote, worship the devil in, in the way that you might think that they would. Now, they're still foolish. But this guy that I was talking to, he says, yeah, no, he's, he's more of a Luciferian. And Luciferianism is extremely wicked. But basically what that is, without going into a lot of detail, they believe that Lucifer, Satan, you know, because God created him, he's an angel of light. They believe that Lucifer was actually a good guy. They believe, oh, no, see, he's trying to help us. When, when, he, you know, when, when Satan deceived Eve in the garden, in the Garden of Eden. He was actually doing good because, hey, he's, try he's trying to give them knowledge, right? What's wrong with knowledge? So that's their view or their spin on the Bible to make Satan out to be some good guy. And I haven't had long enough conversations about all the things they believe to even care about. I don't, I don't know how they deal with all the rest of the Bible where, you know, Satan is just accusing people before God and just, Saying, oh yeah, he'll do, you know, like they did to Job and, and all the destruction and everything he gave to him. But um, it doesn't matter. So, so anyhow, uh, let me get back to, to my point, the point of my story here. I was talking to this guy and he, and he said, no, he's a Luciferian. And I'm trying to, I'm still trying to give him the gospel. And I asked him if he knew what, it, what the Bible teaches that it takes for a person to be saved. And he gave me the right answer. He said, all you got to do is believe on Jesus to be your Savior or, or invite Jesus to your heart to be your sa to save you or just to be your Savior. I can't remember the exact words. But what he said was right. It was actually more right than what I've heard from a lot of people who sometimes you find out they are saved. They just don't know how to verbalize it very well. And they repeat things that they've said, you know, like repent of your sins and all this other stuff. He actually said the right thing, which that's even a little bit more scary because it makes me wonder if he's just some reprobate or not. I don't know. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and, and just hoping that maybe he's just kind of gone astray. And, but um, I, try, you know, I tried to talk to him, but you can tell in, in the way that, that we were talking, you can just tell, you know, people sometimes will come up with these beliefs as if it's just an academic thing. Like, it's just like, well, you know, maybe this is right or maybe that's right. And, you know, and, and no thought to any like serious consequences and, ac and honestly, no obvious belief that there is a God. Because I tried to talk to him about if he believed that there was a creator, is there a God? You know, is there something that made us? Because he said we're programmed. And I was like, yes, I know that we're programmed. I, I agree with that. I believe, I think it's a great word that you use there. Because the atheists don't like to think that we've actually been programmed in certain ways. We've been programmed to know right from wrong. Because if you're programmed, that, then that means there's a programmer. There's someone who decided to give you that code. But this guy I was talking to didn't have a problem with him. But I think what his problem was is that for whatever reason, he's judged God, the God of the Bible, the true God, either to be some wicked God because that's why he's going towards Lucifer or he just simply doesn't have the proper respect and understanding of who God is. And that God is a God of judgment. And that yes, while God forgives and that God is love, God also sends people to hell for an eternity. And a lot of Satanists will look at that and find fault with that because they judge God for sending people to hell. Because they don't think that that's righteous. So they think Satan's actually the good guy. And they're deceived by the deceiver into thinking that, you know, the devil is a good guy. But they fail to understand that the Bible is true. It's been true. It's always true. And they fail to see who's going to win in the end. They, they think that, you know, somehow they're going to receive these powers from Satan or whatever. You know, everyone, they all have different beliefs. I'm not saying that this particular person believes in all these things I'm saying. But Satan is in general, the Luciferians do have that belief. They think that the God of the Bible is really, is like the devil and Satan are just flip-flopped. And that's pretty scary because that is reprobate material. 
When Jesus Christ said that, was talking to the Pharisees, and he said that, you know, if you, if you blaspheme, if you blaspheme God or, you know, the, the Father, if you blaspheme me, he says, you can have forgiveness, but whosoever blasphemeth the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. He says, not in this world, not in the world to come. And the reason why he was saying that is because they were ascribing the power by which people were being healed by the Lord Jesus Christ as of the devil. So when people are saying that Jesus Christ is of the devil, that's what these Luciferians do. They're saying that like God is really the devil and, that's, and that Lucifer is really God. But that God has deceived people, right? The Lord has deceived people and Lucifer is really the, the you know, it doesn't make any sense. I know it's, it's, it's pretty stupid because if Lucifer was really the all-powerful and almighty one, then wouldn't he be able to allow to stop the Lord, Jehovah, from all the confusion and everything? But no, sadly, these people are deceived and they don't understand that there are consequences. I tried to express that to the guy. There's consequences for what you believe. And he knew it, but he, just, he was pretty smug. So hopefully God will work on his heart. But, but people in general need to understand there are people that God hates there are people that God will judge. There are people that will be burned with fire and brimstone for an eternity. Now, turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. Because, of course, God is right to be able to hate people. And all the passages that we looked at so far is God hating people. And you could say, well, God can hate people, but we can't. Okay? But that's not true either. Now, before we get into when would be a proper time for a believer, for a Christian to hate a person, before we get into that, I want to just make clear, as I was preaching already on Sunday night, that we are not to hate our brother. And that is very clear in Scripture. Other believers, we're not to hate them. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse number 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So we see there the commandment from Leviticus saying not to hate your brother and to do good unto him and not suffer sin upon him. Now I'll turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5 because not only are we not to hate our brother, but we're not to be full of hatred either. It shouldn't just be something that's a characteristic of us. Is that you shouldn't be known as someone who's just full of hatred because that is of the flesh. That is not of the spirit. Even though there may be a time where it's righteous, it's okay to, be, to have a hate for somebody, it is not something that should be characteristic of who you are. It should be characteristic of your heart. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These are various, it's very serious sins, and there are people that are full of hatred. And we should not be full of hatred. We should not be full of wrath. We should be very forgiving and merciful and loving, as, as we see from the fruit of the Spirit. And we're also not, turn if you go to Matthew chapter 5, we're also not to hate our own personal enemies. People who are against us. Maybe people that hate us. For any number of reasons. You know, the Bible says that, that if we're not of this world, that the world's going to hate us, just like it hated Jesus. So just because the world hates us doesn't mean that we should just hate everybody in the world. If we hated everyone in the world, we wouldn't go out and preach the gospel. The Bible says in Matthew 5, verse 43, and I think this is where part of the confusion comes from about this subject. Matthew 5, 43, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy enemy, excuse me, thou shalt, <laughs> thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. 
But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So let's understand what Jesus is teaching here. Because for one, I don't believe that there's any contradictions in Scripture. And, and we're just about to get to some of the verses that talk about not God hating people, but a believer hating people, okay? So when we look at Matthew chapter 5 and when we look at Galatians chapter 5, we can't, just, we can't just assume this is talking about every single person in the whole world that we're not to hate because otherwise it would, it would cause a contradiction with other scriptures. So when he says here to love, lo, notice it says love your enemies, your enemies, we may have enemies for all a variety of reasons. We should love them. We should bless them that curse us. Yeah, that's fine. Bless them. You know, when, when someone curses me at the door, you know, I say, have a good day. That's a blessing. Someone yells at me and curses me out just, just for knocking on their door with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I tell them to have a good day. Why? Because I'm not going to get offended and, and, and lower myself to that, like them. And the Bible says, hey, bless them. Do good to them that hate you. That's fine. You can be my enemy. I'll do good to you. I'll bless you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And who, who is the object here of, of having wrong done to them? You are. That's who we're supposed to bless. That's very clear. I mean, that's exactly what the Bible's saying. That's exactly what Jesus says. And then he explains why. He says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. And he's going to equate the way that we respond to people that do this to the way that God deals with people. Because there's certain people, it says here, he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. There are wicked people, there are unjust people, there are unbelievers in this world that are blessed by God anyways. Because God brings the sun up and he brings rain, and, and he brings the blessing that, that the food's going to come up. So that's the reason why, because God still blesses people that can be considered his enemies. God still blesses people that, that do wrong to him. So we can bless people that do wrong to us. Okay, and that's, that, and that's what's being equated here. However, there is a righteous hate that a believer can have. In Ecclesiastes 3, famous passage, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 8, the Bible says, a time to love and a time to hate, a time to war and a time of peace. So there is a time to love and there's a time to hate. There's a time for it. Now, let's just be very clear that that time should be very rare and we get that through abundance of Scripture that talks about us being loving and merciful and compassionate and loving our enemies and things like that. We should be more, def we should definitely be defined by love and not by hate. However, there are some rare instances or rare occurrences where it would be justified to hate somebody. Second Chronicles chapter 19, we're going to see an example of this. And, and again, when Jesus said to pray for them which despitefully use you, that would, if, if what some people take that to mean in Matthew chapter 5 as just being you can't hate anybody ever, then that would contradict what God was saying to Jehu in 2 Chronicles 19. 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2, the Bible says, And Jehu, the son of Anani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So notice, what is he being rebuked for? He's loving people. He's being rebuked 
for loving people. So the Bible does not teach to love everybody regardless. He's being rebuked, and he's not re being rebuked for loving his enemy. Why? Because Ahab wasn't his enemy. He was being rebuked for loving those that hate God. He was being rebuked for loving God's enemies. There's a difference. God's enemies aren't always your enemies. The case here, he helped them out. He loved him. He supported him. Now, I think they should be your enemies. And, you know, any, any enemy of the Lord should be an enemy of you. But anyone, you know, people can hate me all day long. But those that are haters of God, you know what? It's righteous to hate them because obviously we shouldn't love them. Because if we love them, they hate the Lord. There's wrath upon me from before the Lord. Now, this isn't something that God just changed. He has changed his mind on where it used to be bad to love those that hate God. And now all of a sudden it's good to love those that hate God. That's not the case. Proverbs 26, verse 5 says, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Hating a, a whole congregation, a whole gathering of evildoers. Psalm 139, turn if you would to Psalm 139. The Bible says in verse 19, and this is probably the most clear example, but it's all consistent. It's very consistent. Psalm 139, verse 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. So again, who is this talking about? God's enemies. People taking God's name in vain, and a believer wanting to, to, that loves God, hating the people that hate God. Verse 21, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. You can see throughout Scripture, David praying for people, and he's saying, look, I did good to them, but they did evil to me. You know, God, make it right. But he wasn't saying he hated them. But you know who's saying he's hating? Those that hate God. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? Verse 22, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. He's even saying, well, search me out, God. I have a perfect hatred. Is this right? Now look, if this wasn't right, in order to be scripture, God would have to give some form of rebuke within the scripture showing, no, this is actually completely wrong. But you know what? This is God's holy word that's preserved. And because it's in God's word, it is true. It is right. When the prophet, when holy men of God are speaking by the Holy Ghost, that's scripture. And that's exactly what David is doing in Psalm 139. He's speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And it's a righteous, perfect hatred. Now, again, it's not our own enemies. It's God's enemies. It's those that hate God. It's the reprobates of the world. There's nothing wrong. Look, there's nothing wrong with hating the child molester. There's nothing wrong with hating the serial killer. There's nothing wrong with hating these people that hate God. But let's face it, that's, that is a very, very, very small percentage of the people at large. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 5. Psalm 5, verse 7. The Bible says, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. He's saying, because again, this is following up the verses that we just read about God hating the, you know, the, the workers of iniquity. He's saying, yeah, but that's not me. I'm not the worker of iniquity. I'm not the person that God hates. As for me, I'm going to come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. Hey, God, I'm going to receive your mercy. I'm going to receive your love. I'm going to receive your long suffering. You know, you hate those people. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like them. Though. I'm not going to be like that. I love you. And, I, and, and it says, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. 
Why? Because he actually respects and fears God. Verse number eight, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. And again, he's, he's continuing to describe the people that God hates. That their inwardness is full of just wickedness. And these are like the reprobate Pharisees that Jesus was rebuking. In Matthew chapter 23, and he's, and he's calling them serpents and vipers and, and children of the devil. Verse number 10, destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. And the, this prayer is, is praying for the righteous judgment of God to, to come upon the people that hate him. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. People that hate God, nothing wrong with praying that God just, just do what he's going to do anyways. We know he's going to do it. It's in the Bible. But we need to understand through all of this, through all of God's judgment, through all of God's uh, um, wrath, that we aren't the ones responsible for carrying any of that stuff out. That God will do it. We can pray God to, for God to do it according to His will. But we don't take these matters into our own hands. Romans chapter 12, verse number 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It's God's job to bring his vengeance. And we could pray for him to do that. Verse number 20, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. And again, going back to the concept of your enemy. When your enemy hungers, hey, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Why? Because God's going to be the one that rights the wrongs. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Psalm 5, let's close out the chapter here. Verse number 11, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous, with favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Turn, if you would, to Nahum chapter 1. It's the last place we're going to turn. We're, we're done after this. Nahum chapter number 1. Because in Psalm 5, we see the, the going back and forth between, you know, God pouring out judgment upon people that he hates and hating the workers of iniquity, but then, you know, the righteous loving God and, and having fear of God and being, and being happy about about him being his defender. And it kind of goes back and forth for a few verses there and ends on this positive note, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Because God's our defender. God's our protector. God's going to make sure that we're safe from those that hate us. And in Nahum chapter 1, we're going to see this great passage about the vengeance of God and his goodness to those that trust in him. Basically, like we saw in Psalm 5. Oh, this is appropriate. So we're going to read, starting in verse number two, the Bible says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. God revenges. God takes care of business. The Lord revengeth and is furious. There's his anger, his wrath. He's furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, on his adversaries, on his enemies. And he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger. And look, we could learn from this. We should be slow to anger as well. And he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord, excuse me, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. 
this, this incredible power of the Lord and His anger and His fury and just His ability to just destroy everything and the power that's there. Hey, we need to remember who God is. Remember who God is. Verse 7, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust in Him. Those that have faith, believers, trust in the Lord. He's good. He's a stronghold. But those that don't trust in the Lord and those that hate God better watch out because He is a God of vengeance. He will repay. He will right all the wrongs. Verse 8, But with an over overrunning flood, He will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue His enemies. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. We need to remember every, everything about God. Let's not be too one-sided either way. As much as God has mercy and long-suffering, hey, we should exalt that and we love that. I love that. I'm thankful for God's mercy. I really am. This life would be miserable without God's, God's mercy. But we also have to remember that God has anger and wrath and fury and there's people that God hates. That's a fact. It's what the scripture says. So we could either just accept our, our own, the, the thoughts of our own heart as being true or we could accept God's word as being true. I'm going to go with God's word. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for telling us all these details about who you are. And um, Lord, I pray that it will help us to be even more humble and to give the proper respect that's due unto you, dear Lord. Thank you for, for saving us, for loving us enough to save us, dear Lord, and for loving the whole world to, to send your only begotten Son to, to die for the sins of the whole world, dear Lord. It's unfortunate that some people reject you and just make you their enemy. And um, God, help us not to make the same mistake that Jehoshaphat made and, and love those that hate you. And, and to bless them that, that hate you, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to, to get this, this doctrine down right. And Lord, help us also, as, as in the beginning of the chapter we saw, to be going to you regularly, going to you first thing in the morning and, and go to you in prayer. And we know that you hear us, dear Lord. And we thank you for that as well, that you're God that answers prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>